perfect. God is merciful. Oh, think of that word right there. How many of you are glad God is merciful? Man, he's been so merciful in my life, and I am thankful for it. Last week, we stopped right in the middle of a powerful argument that Paul was laying out. So you got to think of Romans 9 through 11 as you do like one of your favorite uh, mini series or shows on TV. You know, any good show, you know what they do? They leave you hanging right in the middle of it. And then when you come back to the next episode, they start with a what? A recap. They got to catch you back up to speed. So that's what we got to do first. Before we jump into this, I got to give you a quick recap. Romans chapter 9 begins and Paul is burdened. He says that there was a great heaviness and a continual sorrow in his heart because his brethren, the Jewish people, the children of Israel, they were lost. They were accursed. They were cut off from Christ. God was going to set them aside and he was going to replace them temporarily with the church. Now that brings up a huge question. How in the world could this be? How could God set aside his chosen people and how could he still be faithful to keep his word at the same time? Was he breaking his promises? And the answer to that question is no, absolutely not. Because salvation has never had anything to do with your physical birth. Salvation has never had anything to do with how good or how bad you are, with right or with wrong. Salvation has everything to do with the purpose of God according to election. Salvation is God's idea. And he sets it up and he says, you know what God did? God chose Isaac over his brother Ishmael. Not only that, if you want to go to the next generation, God chose Jacob over his twin brother who was actually older than him, Esau, and he chose them. He selected Jacob over Esau before they were ever born, before they ever had a chance to even do right or wrong because salvation is God's idea. And then last week we ended at, man, we ended at one of those really big parts. Like, you know, when an episode ends and you just want to fast forward, you'd like, you want to just go straight into the next one because you got to see where we pick up. That's kind of how we left last week. Look at verse 13. It says, as it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. That's a, if you stop and think about that, if you're with me this morning, is everybody here with me? Y'all here? Okay, good. You all are here. I can tell. If you stop and pause and consider a verse like that, that's a big statement. This is God speaking. Jacob have I loved and Esau have I hated. Now look at how he begins in verse 14 because it just leads to the next logical question. He says in verse 14, what shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? The way that God dealt with Ishmael and Isaac, was he unrighteous? The way that God dealt with Jacob and Esau, was he unrighteous to choose Jacob over Esau? The way that God deals with you and me, the way that God works in our world today, is there any unrighteousness with God? And all God's people, what are the last two words in that verse? Everybody out loud together. God forbid. There is no unrighteousness with God. In fact, he's the furthest thing from unrighteous. He is merciful. He is merciful. Let's jump right into it. We got a lot of ground to cover in a short amount of time. Y'all stay with me, okay? Be good students. All right, just stay with me. Here we go. The first thing we're gonna look at is a sovereign mercy. A sovereign mercy, look at verse 15. He says, for he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. Everybody read the end of that verse with me. And I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Here, Paul's answering the question, is there any unrighteousness with God? And you know what he doesn't turn to? He doesn't turn to defending the fact that God is righteous and God is just. That's not what he says. He doesn't just come right in there and say, how dare you? Of course God is righteous. Of course he's just. No, you know what he says? I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. He completely flips the script. He turns the question upside down. He says, here you are trying to challenge God on his justness and righteousness. Let me tell you something. If God was just and he was righteous, what would happen to all of you? What would happen to me? We would receive wrath. We would receive eternal condemnation and punishment in a very real, literal place called hell. That's what we deserve. And if God was only just and if he was only righteous, that's what we would all get. But he comes in right off the bat and he says, no, 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 no. Listen, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. 
and compassion on whom I will have compassion. He is, it's not just a mercy, it's a sovereign mercy because God can choose who he wants to have mercy on and who he wants to have compassion on. Now look how he continues to explain this. Look at verse 16. He says, so then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth. And everybody read that last phrase. But of God that showeth mercy. God shows mercy. We can't will ourselves to be saved. You can't wake up one day and say, oh man, I desperately want to be saved. If God had not revealed himself through creation and through his word and in, in, in ourselves by giving us this idea of right or wrong, if he had not revealed himself at all, we would have no idea that we even needed a savior. It's only because God's mercy that we even recognize that we're broken and that we need somebody outside of ourselves to save ourselves. You can't will yourself to be saved. And not only that, you can't run to be saved. No amount of strenuous effort and labor on your part. You could not right now if you decide it today, in this new year, if your new year's resolution was, I am going to turn over a new leaf, and from this day forward, I'm going to be the best human being I can possibly be. I'm going to be kind to my spouse every single day, and I'm not going to get angry. And I'm going to do good works to the people at work. I mean, you could make up your mind, and you could determine to live as righteous as you could possibly think of. And guess what? It's not going to ever be good enough. It's not going to ever save you. We are only saved because God, in his infinite power and glory and wisdom, chose to show us mercy. God doesn't just show us his mercy, though. God also shows his power. Look at verses 17 and 18. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, even for the same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and everybody this last phrase together, and whom he will he hardeneth. Let's talk about Pharaoh for a minute. If you're familiar with the Old Testament and if you're familiar with the story of the children of Israel, you're going to know Pharaoh. He's a very dominant figure, a very dominant person in the story. If you go back to Exodus, if you want some good reading this week, start reading. Actually, start in Genesis. Work your way into Exodus. It's phenomenal how the story plays out. And you'll find that God calls his servant Moses. He's out in the wilderness. He speaks to him in a burning bush. And he says, you know what I want you to do? I want you to go to Pharaoh and I want you to march right up to him into the palace, into the most powerful man in all of the earth at that time, office, and I want you to say, God told me to come and tell you, let my people go. Now, how many of you would like that assignment right there? <laughs> so, 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 he, so he does that. He shows up, and by the way, he has access into Pharaoh's palace because he actually grew up with Pharaoh. He was like a stepbrother to Pharaoh growing up, so that's why he even was allowed access in there and why he's able to speak so boldly to him. And he goes up and he looks at Pharaoh and he says, God told me to come and tell you to let my people go. And what do you think Pharaoh did? Pharaoh laughed. And he said, okay, fine. God's going to start unleashing a series of proving to you who he really is. And there's 10 plagues that come as a result. First, he turns the water into blood. Pharaoh laughs. He says, my sorcerers and magicians can do the same thing. Next, he sends frogs. How many of you would love it if you tucked yourself into bed tonight and there was a nice little frog that was laying right in there with you? How many of you would like that right there, anybody? How many of you husbands would have to go on like a march for the rest of your night until you found that frog and eradicated it from your house before your wife would be able to go back to sleep? How many of you wives would have to do that for your husband? How Anybody like that? <laughs> Listen, frogs, we're not talking about just one frog or like a little lizard that escapes into your house when you open up the door at night in Florida, okay? We're not talking about that. Could you imagine like literally your house covered in frogs? You can't get away from them. He sends that and then he moves on and he sends lice and then flies. And then it starts getting really serious. He sends a plague to their livestock and all of their meat and their milk and their animals begin to die and they get diseased and sick. And then he sends boils. Do you imagine just sitting there just in boils and in pain? And then he sends locusts. Everything green, anything that was green, all of their crops, everything gone, devoured by the locusts. And then he sends darkness. Could you imagine the fear and terror? Like all of your meat, all of your crops, everything's gone. You've had boils on your skin. You've had every unbelievable act of God come your way that cannot be described any other way. And now you're sitting there in darkness. Can you imagine the fear and terror that starts creeping across the land? And then it ends with the worst out of all. The firstborn in all the land dies. How many of you believe that God showed his power in an unbelievable and undeniable way? You know what you find as you read through that whole entire account in Exodus? 
over and over again, it says God hardened his heart. God hardened his heart. God in his sovereignty hardened the heart of Pharaoh. You know what else you're going to find as you read through that? You'll find a few times, at least three times, where it says that Pharaoh hardened his heart. There's a mystery at play here. There is a sovereignty of God. There is a free will of man. I can never fully explain how those two things interact. But I know that we have a powerful enough God who says in his word that he raised Pharaoh up for destruction. He raised him up that he might display his mighty power in him. And I also know that Pharaoh had a hard heart. And I know that when he died and he went to hell, that he stood there and he was guilty before God because of his hardness of heart and because of his rejection and his rebellion against God. First thing that we've got to realize before we move any further, you've got to cry out for mercy. That's our first practical application. We've got to cry out for mercy. The wonder is not that some are saved and some are not, but that anyone is saved at all. You understand that? That's the wonder that any of us would be saved. We need to stop questioning God. We need to stop throwing it in his face and questioning his righteousness. No, the simple fact that any of us can come to faith in Jesus Christ is more than enough mercy that we don't deserve. And you know what? It was only because of hard hearts, and it's only going to be a hard, unrepentant heart that makes you stand before God as a just, righteous, holy, judging God, as opposed to a merciful, gracious, forgiving God. So cry out for mercy because it does not have to be that way. The reason why Pharaoh was raised up, the reason why you're hearing this today and why we're talking about it is because God is merciful and his mercy is available. Cry out for mercy. Second thing I want you to understand is that we are talking about a fascinating mercy. Not only is it a sovereign mercy, it's a fascinating mercy. Look at verse 19. It says this, Thou wilt say then unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? These are really logical questions, okay? If you're following along in the argument, I mean, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. Is there unrighteousness with God? No, God's not unrighteous. God's merciful. But by the way, he will have mercy on whom he will have mercy. He will have compassion on whom he will have compassion. And I raised Pharaoh up and I hardened his heart. So you know what the logical questions that come next are this. If God is sovereign, who can resist him? Which by the way, isn't that true? If God is sovereign and he shows up and he demands that you do something and he, he can force us to do whatever he wants. If God is sovereign, who can resist him? And then the second question that they ask in that verse is this. If we can't resist him, how can he blame us for our response? If God's that big and that powerful and if Pharaoh couldn't resist him, then how could Pharaoh be responsible for his response. Look at what God answers this with. This is so good. Look at verses 20 and 21. Everybody read these first four words out loud with me, okay? Put them up on the screen, verse 20. Everybody out loud together, first four words. Nay, but, O man. (laughs) Again, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, why hast thou made me thus? And then go on to verse 21. And it says, Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? This is a reference to Isaiah 45, 9. And you know what it says there? Woe unto him that striveth with his maker. Who are we to question God? Now, God's merciful. And there are times in our lives when we go before God and we say, God, how could this happen? What in the world are you doing? But who in the world are we to get angry and to get hard hearts and to become resistant and to get upset and to start blaming God for who he is and what he's doing in this world? You know something that we all need to understand? We need to be put in our place. He is God and we are not. He is the creator. We are his creation. And he has every right to do whatever he wants to with us and in his world. And there's absolutely nothing that we can do to stop it. And the smartest thing in all the world that we could do is to submit and to surrender and just say, okay, you are God and I am not. Who in the world are we to question God? By the way, God has his purposes. This is a good paper right here. This is a good argumentative essay. I mean, Paul is just laying it out. Look at verse 22. (laughs) This is so good. Those three words right there. What if God? Hmm. What if God actually knows what he's doing? What if God's actually had a plan and he's a brilliant designer and a creator and he's 
smarter than we could ever possibly imagine. He's wiser. What if his ways are beyond our ways and his thinking is past our thinking? What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction? And that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared unto glory. Everybody, those first two words of verse 24, help me out here. Even us, <laughs> even us, whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. What if God, in his sovereign power over the universe, made this world where not everybody would be saved? says that he created vessels unto honor and dishonor. What if before he made us, he knew he was going to give us a free choice and he knew that people would reject him. And out of the same lump of dirt that he created you and I out of, he created other people that would reject him and he created vessels unto honor and vessels unto dishonor. What if God did that? What if God, willing to show his wrath and his power, created vessels of wrath like Pharaoh, fit it for destruction so that you and I would understand who this God is and how omnipotent he is and how powerful he is so that we would have a better understanding of him? What if God tolerates the evil and the wicked people of the world to prove how patient and merciful and loving he is? What if God also created vessels of mercy, even us, to make known the riches of his glory? What if that's why we exist in this world, to show the world what it looks like to be one of God's children, to show the world what it looks like when you profess your faith in Jesus, you follow him in baptism, he turns your life upside down, he pours out his blessings on your life, and even in the midst of chaos, even in the midst of death, even in the midst of brokenness, there's a joy, there's a peace, there's a strength, and other people look at you and they say, what in the world is different? What is going on? And you say, it's Jesus. It's God. You know who I am? I'm a vessel of mercy and he's pouring out the riches of it, the glory of his grace on my life. What if God has always had a wonderful plan of salvation? And what if all we have to do is believe and put our faith and trust in him? Wow. God has his purposes. And he concludes his argument by proving what he was really out to prove in this whole chapter, that God keeps his word. God keeps his word. Everything that happened with the Jews' rejection of Jesus, he told about in the Old Testament. Everything that happened with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, he told about in the Old Testament. Paul, getting saved, was not a mistake. God had already selected him and chosen him for the job that he was calling him to do before the foundation of the world. You and I getting saved and putting our faith and trust in him, all of this has gone exactly according to his will and as he's planned. And he talked about it all in the Old Testament. Look at verse 25. It says, as he saith also in Osi, that's Hosea, that's his, that's his name in Greek. I will call them my people, which were not my people, and her beloved, which was not beloved. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, ye are not my people, there shall they be called the children of the living God. Hosea is one of the awesome servants and prophets of God that you'll find in the Bible. It's an incredible story. You know what God told his prophet Hosea to do? He said, I want you to go marry a prostitute. And guess what? She was unfaithful, almost like you would, almost like you would expect. And the whole reason God told him to marry her was it was a living parable of the relationship that Israel had with God. Israel was unfaithful. God was faithful. They have children, their second daughter, you know what God tells him to name her? He says, name her Loruhama. Lo you know what that means? Not loved. Can you imagine naming your child that? God has his purposes and his plans. He says, name her Loruhama, not loved, because I will no longer show love to the house of Israel. They have a third child, also a da daughter, and he tells him to name her Loami, which means not my people. Because he added, you are not my people and I am not your God. And he's speaking to Israel and he's saying, listen, you are my chosen people. But because of your rejection of me, there's coming a day where you will no longer be loved and you will no longer be not my people. It's proving a point here. 
But then in the same place where you were told that, there's gonna be a reverse of fortune and you are gonna be loved and you are gonna be my people because I am faithful to keep my word and I am merciful. But this really wasn't about Israel. You know what he's saying? He's saying, you're wondering how the Gentiles can be saved? Well, guess what? There was a day and time where you weren't my people and you weren't loved and I reversed it and turned it around. And for those Gentiles, yeah, they weren't my people and they weren't loved, but anytime I want to, I can turn it all around. And you know what that means for you and me too? Man, I'm getting chills. I'm serious. It gets me excited. You know what that means for us? There was a time in your life you weren't his people. You weren't loved by God like an adopted child. We were foreigners. We were enemies of Christ. But God, in his grace and his mercy, called us and he saved us by his glorious grace. To God be the glory. Wow. Then he goes to the book of Isaiah. And he says in verse 27, Isaiah also crieth concerning Israel. Though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. And as Isaiah said before, except the Lord of Sabbath had left us a seed, we had been as Sodom and been made like unto Gomorrah. You know what's happening here? God had been faithful to his word. He told Abraham, I will make your... I will make your children as the sand of the seashore. And he did that. But you know what he said? Only a remnant of them are going to be saved. There's going to be a multitude of Gentiles that get saved, but there's only going to be a small amount of his people, the Israelites, that get saved. You know the short work that he's talking about? One day God's going to come back and he's going to judge the earth. And when he does, it's going to be quick, it's going to be full, and it's going to be complete. And those people that aren't waiting for God, those people that have hard hearts and are shaking their fists in God's face, and even Christians who are apathetic and sleeping, it's going to feel like it catches you totally out of surprise and it blindsides you because that's what he's going to do. He's going to make a short work. He's been long suffering. He's been patient. He's put up with it, but there's a day coming when he's going to come back and it's going to be quick and it's going to be instant. And if it wasn't for his mercy in saving a remnant of the children of Israel, they would have been completely destroyed just like Sodom and Gomorrah. How many of you agree that's a pretty tough lesson to the children of Israel? God's not doing this to be harsh. He's doing it to show his mercy. He's doing this all so that they'll come to repentance and put their faith and trust in Jesus. Before we move on to the last point and wrap this up, here's the practical application. Check yourself. There's a good old probably southern saying where it started. Check yourself before you. That's right. Let's say that out loud. We got to get this sinking in. Check yourself before you. Now let's say it like we actually mean it and we're going to live by it. This is good advice. Even if it came from a redneck somewhere, I don't know. But listen, check yourself before you. That's great advice. What do we need to check ourselves in? We need to check ourselves and make sure that we are actually a vessel of mercy. Verse 23. Verse 23. If you don't have that underlined or highlighted, do it. It says, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared unto glory. You know, you were prepared beforehand. You were a vessel of mercy chosen before you were ever born. God in his love and infinite grace said, I'm going to pour out the riches of my glory on you. Wow. Well, here's the question. Are you a vessel of mercy? We're born in this world. We're born blind. We're born lost. And do you remember that day where you started hearing about Jesus and he began to soften your heart and he began to open your eyes and you remember when it all clicked and you were like, that's, I'm broken. He died to pay for my sins. I can be a new creation in Christ. Has your hard heart been softened? Has everything about your life changed when you put your faith and trust in Jesus? Are you a vessel of mercy? Hey, you know what else the Bible tells us? Surely goodness and mercy shall follow you all the days of your life. You know, this message isn't just for someone that's not saved. I hope you're not sitting here just thinking, oh, this is a great message for someone that's lost. This is a great message for every single person that's in here this morning. Did you wake up today overwhelmed by God and his goodness and his grace and his mercy? Or do you wake up today and you're complaining and grumbling and got bad attitudes about the week and the weather and whatever it is? It was cold this morning. We live in Florida, by golly, right? By golly, okay, anyway. <laughs> I mean, we complain, don't we? 
And we don't always see, did we wake up today and were we overcome by the goodness of God that was there? The second you woke up and the second you go to bed tonight, it's never gonna leave you. In fact, it's pursuing you. And it doesn't matter where you find yourself. It doesn't matter what you're going through. It doesn't matter if you have cancer. It doesn't matter if your world is falling apart. If you know God, his mercy and his grace is there and it will follow you every single day of your life and nobody can ever take it away from you. Check yourself. How's your attitude? One more. You know what the Bible says? Blessed are they who are merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Mercy begets mercy. God was merciful to us, and he softened our hard hearts so that we would in turn be merciful to others. And when we're merciful to others, they in turn, then we receive mercy. Mercy begets mercy. When you turn on the news, do you feel merciful? When you get out on the road and someone cuts you off, do you feel merciful? When your neighbors keep you up at night doing ridiculous things, do you feel merciful? No, listen, here's the point. So often we're just like the rest of the world around us and we get filled with hatred and bitterness and we don't act anything like God created us to act, what he saved us for. You know, when Jesus saw the world and the brokenness and all of its problems, he was moved with compassion because they fainted. They were sheep without a shepherd. They were doing what lost people do. We're not lost. We know God. And he left us here in this world so that we would show his mercy. Man, we cannot be angry and bitter and upset. We've got to be merciful and moved with compassion. And that leads me to the last point, and we are done. A compelling mercy. It's a sovereign mercy. It's a fascinating mercy. It's a compelling mercy. Look at verses 30 and 31. See if you pick up on the irony of what he's saying in these verses, okay? See if you pick it up. Verse 30. What shall we say then? That the Gentiles which followed not after righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith? But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Here's the irony. The Gentiles found a righteousness they weren't even looking for. And the Jews never had the righteousness they were so proud of and they were working so hard for. The Gentiles are out there just living their best lives, man. They're just rolling along. And God shows up and Jesus reveals himself. And they're like, wow, I'm broken. This this all makes sense. I need a savior. And they put their faith in him. And all of a sudden they have a righteousness they were never pursuing and they were never after. And yet the spiritual self-righteous people who are trying so hard to prove how good and how great they are and how obedient to the law they are, they never even came close to having what they thought they had. And why is this? Verse 32, wherefore? Because they sought it not by faith. (laughs) They sought it by works, not by faith. But as it were by the works of the law, and here is the phrase, for they stumbled at the stumbling stone. They stumbled at the stumbling stone. And then look at verse, the last verse, verse 33. It says, as it is written, behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and rock of offense. And whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. First practical application is this. Don't stumble. Don't stumble. I have a pack here of gold nuggets. I use these at Christmas. It was one of the gifts that the wise men brought to Jesus. Now imagine if I took these out and I dropped them. And I spread them all over the stage just like this. How many of you have children? How many of those kids have had Legos? How many of you ever woke up in the middle of the night and you stepped on one of those Legos or whatever toy it was, it was a block, and you didn't feel very merciful or act merciful at all in that moment? (laughs) Check yourself before you wreck yourself with your own offspring. You all get the picture, right? Man, if I were to take my shoes off, if I were to turn off all the lights as I'm walking through this stage, I'm going to step on some landmines, right? Right? Do you understand this is exactly God and his mercy? It's what he's done in this world. He's laid Jesus Christ out as a stumbling stone. And what we do is we don't even look down. We don't even see what's right in front of us. We have our eyes up and we're pursuing our our careers and we're pursuing our pleasure and we're pursuing whatever it is that we think is going to bring us satisfaction and happiness. And all along the way, we keep tripping over Jesus. And you know what we do? We just kick him out of the way. No, get out of my way. I, I want what I want. I don't want to pay attention. I don't want to listen. And we stumble at the stumbling stone and we just curse it and we kick it. Stop stumbling. 
God's merciful. And you know what it takes? It takes repentance and belief. What if instead of tripping over, we actually got down and we looked at it and we said, whoa, whoa, this is Jesus. I need a savior. Whoa, I realize that he's the treasure that I've been searching for and looking for my entire life. I realize that in this situation, that I need healing. And guess what? Jesus can give me the healing that I need. I realize in this situation, I need strength because I can't face my obstacles. And oh my goodness, Jesus is what I need. And in every single area of your life, if you get on your knees and you humble yourself and you stop tripping and stumbling over him and you stop living with those hard hearts and you get your eyes focused on Jesus, you'll realize that that's what you've been looking for your entire life.